No xadrez, a peça de menor valor é o peão. O peão só pode andar uma casa por vez e numa única direção, para frente. Mas em determinadas circunstâncias, o peão pode se tornar a peça mais poderosa do tabuleiro de xadrez. Quando o peão chega à última casa, ele pode se transformar em qualquer outra peça mais poderosa, cavalo, bispo, torre, até rainha. O peão só não pode se transformar em uma peça, o rei. Mesmo que você não entenda nada de xadrez, vai se interessar pela história de um peão que ousou se transformar em rei. Seu nome é Gary Kasparov. A história desse homem começou a ser traçada antes de seu nascimento. Filho de pai judeu e mãe armênia, nascido no Azerbaijão. A vida de Gary Kasparov resume a mistura de etnias que formou a antiga União Soviética. E não fosse a União Soviética, Gary nunca teria se tornado Kasparov. Em geral, o chess foi muito bem recebido. There were there were cultural traditions, but also there was a lot of support from the state, because chess was seen by the communist officials as the ideological weapon to prove the intellectual superiority of communist regime over decadent West. So that's why, in chess, if you had a talent in chess, I mean, you you would have great opportunity to to develop. Lenin, the leader of the Revolution Communist of 1917, was an enthusiast of chess. O Partido Comunista investiu pesado no jogo para os trabalhadores. Nos campos e nas fábricas, todos podiam jogar xadrez. Por isso, não surpreende que o título mundial de xadrez tenha se tornado um monopólio soviético. Assim como no jogo das bonecas russas, conhecidas como matrioscas, um grande mestre sucedia o outro. O primeiro campeão mundial soviético foi Mikhail Botvinnik, da Rússia, em 1948. Depois veio o outro russo, Vassili Smyslov. Mikhail Tal, da Letônia. Tigran Petrosian, da Armênia. Boris Spassky, da Rússia. A hegemonia soviética só foi quebrada em 1972 por um gênio vindo dos Estados Unidos, Bob Fischer. A vitória de um americano em plena Guerra Fria, foi um golpe para o Partido Comunista. Para destronar Bob Fischer, em 1975, a União Soviética apostou todas as fichas em seu mais talentoso jovem, Anatoly Karpov. Mas Karpov nem precisou desafiar Fischer. Já sofrendo dos problemas psicológicos que o atormentaram até o fim da vida, Fischer recusou-se a enfrentar Karpov. Assim, o campeão voltava a ser um grande mestre soviético. Tudo indicava que o domínio comunista tinha voltado para ficar, mas a matriosca que ia suceder Karpov não era exatamente do agrado do partido. Almost instantly, almost instantly, I learned to play chess somewhere in '69, and in '70 I was sent to a chess group at Pine Palace in Baku, and nobody had doubts, nobody. Around me, I had doubts that chess. I mean, I had a unique chess talent, which didn't mean that I would be the world champion or top player. But there were all conditions in place for me to develop this talent. Nessa lista de grandes duelos, o xadrez tem um lugar de honra. Karpov versus Kasparov. Os dois eram antagonistas em tudo, a começar pela política. I think it's already when I was. Yes, yeah, 1718. It was very, very clear that uh, 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 the Soviet system would not like uh, um, another challenge to Karpov, a real challenge to Karpov. Uh, not that I was uh, a total stranger for the system. Also, you know, I was half Armenian, half Jewish. Uh, Karpov was ethnic Russian. But I think more important was that Karpov was a loyal soldier of the party, and I. They, they sense that I was not, uh, I was not uh, um, positively affected by the communist ideas. So I was uh, free-minded, uh, and I believed in this in, in, in things that uh, were very were quite contradictory. So I already sensed resistance uh, uh, on different levels to uh, prevent my further progress. Some 
players defected like Korchnoi. They went to the West. Why didn't you do so? Korchnoi defected when he was uh, in, in his mid-40s. Um, now, I, I never had even the idea because I had my family, my mother was there. And when I say family, it's extended family. It's more like, you know, the uh, southern or oriental when you had my mother's sisters and their kids, my cousins. So it's like a big family. And it was my, you know, my country, this environment where I felt most comfortable. Uh, even now, you know, just it's, look at the last 10, 15 years, I could be, even decide to live elsewhere. And that might be more profitable for me, not to be engaged in this political fight against the new dictatorship in Russia. But still, it's very difficult to cut your roots. So for me, it was never an option. Entre 1984 e 1990, Garry Kasparov e Anatoly Karpov disputaram cinco vezes o título mundial. Ao todo, foram 144 partidas. Para se ter uma ideia do equilíbrio entre os dois, foram 21 vitórias de Kasparov, 19 de Karpov e nada menos que 104 empates. Impossível falar de Kasparov sem Karpov e vice-versa. In the 80s, I think it was very simple because we represented a very different set of values. Karpov, uh, uh, one way or another, was part of this old Soviet system. But the fact is, he was and he still is a great chess player. So it's, it's not like the faceless bureaucrat. But he was very much defended by the system. He was engraved in the system. Uh, and I was fighting the system. I believe the system was wrong, the system was deadly and uh, d destructive. Uh, also, we had style differences, so it created the perfect field for, uh, for rivalry. Uh, I was proud, still proud, that I, I won. We played these five matches and I ended up as a winner. Uh, but today, we have nothing to share. So we still are quite far apart on the political uh, views. So Karpov is in, indifferent or even friendly to what's happening in Russia uh, while I'm fighting it fiercely. But when it comes to chess, we both recognize that it's, it's for the world champions to, to get together and to influence the change because the game is in really bad shape. And here we don't have any differences. So Karpov and myself were looking at the chess problems from the same angle. Mesmo boicotado pelo sistema, Kasparov conseguiu desafiar Karpov pelo título mundial em 1984. O jovem desafiante tinha apenas 21 anos. A disputa foi marcada no coração do sistema, a Praça Vermelha, em Moscou. O primeiro que vencesse seis partidas seria o campeão. Karpov começou melhor, abriu 5 a 0. À beira do abismo, Kasparov reagiu. Depois de 14 empates seguidos, o desafiante começou a vencer uma atrás da outra. E reduziu o placar para 5 a 3. Nesse instante, os cartolas do xadrez decidiram suspender a disputa. Quando eu jogava Carpo, era diferente, como fogo e fogo. Mas era muito importante quem poderia realmente dominar a agenda. Same em business. You, you look at the history of, of um, uh, um, uh, military history, the battlegrounds. Uh, if you had, let's say, medieval battle, battleground, you have cavalry, you want to uh, fight on the valley. If you're fighting against cavalry, you're looking for the hills. So it's very important to actually identify the environment, the landscape, the old elements uh, of this, of, 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 um, of, 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 that will be crucial for your decision making. Before you say, I'll have to do this. And that's why simply giving an advice to uh, a group of people, to do something specific is wrong because some of them are very good in micromanagement. Some of them are very good in the big picture. So, and, and if you give them the same advice, it could be very useful for one and poisonous for others. Um novo duelo Karpov-Kasparov foi marcado para 1985. Desta vez, Kasparov estava preparado, venceu por 5 a 3 e tornou-se, aos 22 anos, o mais jovem campeão da história. Nesse dia, além de uma coroa de louros, ele recebeu um estranho conselho. Eu 
sort of on my peak. It's the it was the greatest moment. So it's like uh, you conquer the earth, sky's the limit, and suddenly you know you hear this very profound philosophical warning. I think later, you know, I thought that was a, a very good advice, if you may call it advice, because on one side, you know, she could be right. On another side, she could, she was giving me sort of new motivation to prove her wrong. For me, it was always search for perfection. I, I looked for the best moves. I wanted to expand the horizons of the game. I was looking for new ideas. So just, I, I need to, you know, I never had any problems, uh, 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 motivational problems, to uh, uh, um, search for self-improvement. So that's why for me, consuming information and coming up with new ideas was like a natural algorithm. Yeah, and uh, I had many challenges, you know, I, after I beat Karpov and I became the world champion, I had to face other younger players and then even younger players. So it was just, and then there were computers and I always had to update sort of my, my uh, um, decision-making mechanism.